In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. I rarely, if ever, have a title for my sermons. Some preachers do, their brain just works that way. Mine can't really ever settle there. But this week, a podcast I listened to offered this one and the reflection for this gospel reading from Luke. The title was, Well, Then When? Well, Then When? It seems that there's a woman who we are told appeared to Jesus as he was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And for the last 18 years, she was unable to stand upright, bowed down, and bent over. For the last 18 years, she would have had to crane and twist her head awkwardly and painfully to do the simple, ordinary things of life. To look up at the sky. To look into someone's eyes to be greeted and seen face to face, to take in what is life. This physical crippling would surely have been but an outward and visible sign of an inward sense of being cut off, forgotten, disregarded, unseen. She was bound up and tied down in body and in spirit. All of this for 18 long years. We are told that it wasn't just that she had a bad back, but rather that it was a spirit that had crippled her. There's not a lot more that's said about that why or where it came from or how, but it surely had a grip on her that cut off the fullness of her life and left her destitute outside and cast away. Jesus comes to her and says, you are set free. She was not just healed, she was set free, liberated, and given life in its most abundant fullness, the kind of abundant life Jesus imagines and seeks and works for for all of God's people. Pretty amazing stuff, miraculous even. In the midst of her suffering, Jesus drew near to her. In the midst of his teaching, Jesus prioritized her. In the midst of the crowds, Jesus still saw her. His desire for her wholeness, for her liberation, for her healing and thriving, for her to have a full life was not going to be contained or limited. And if the story stopped there, we could all go home feeling happy for her. And like our guy did the right thing, we're on the right team. But it doesn't. In the next moment, the moment of conflict, of friction, we come to see that the kingdom of God come to earth is disruptive to our timelines It upends our plans, it resets our understandings, it deepens and widens our imagination for what is possible. It is at this intersection of the dreams and ideas God has for the world and the ways we think this world ought to work, it's right there that our story takes place as we see the synagogue leader trying to do his job and yet having to confront some of the hardest questions and challenges and invitations, his world based, and so too ours. These are the challenges and questions that we face on a big macro level and within our own hearts and souls. You see, just after this woman is not just made well but set free, just after the synagogue leader says, not today, there are six other days you can do that, but not today. Just after that, just after that, Jesus confronts him, he has this sort of reaction in that moment to how he thinks it should have happened. Now, read in a more generous way, this leader was attempting to do what it is his tradition did and does, to rest entirely and completely on the day set aside for Sabbath. But Jesus knows that there's more going on here. He knows that among the faithful Jews of his day and of the days before him and since, the question was not if the Sabbath should be kept, but how. As one writer puts it, Sabbath keeping was one of the ways the Jews defined themselves and kept their identity even over long centuries of living in exile and diaspora, living as strangers in a strange land. There was no other people that had a weekly day of rest. So Sabbath was one of the important ways to maintain Jewish identity. 
By Jesus' time, the Sabbath law was interpreted differently by different Jewish sects. There was an ongoing debate among rabbis and other teachers of the law. What could you do and not do on the Sabbath? What constituted work? Lighting a fire to cook? Taking your livestock out to pasture? Jesus knows this debate. And from other tellings of this same story in the other Gospels, we know that this synagogue leader is not the strictest enforcer of Sabbath rules. And yet, here he is, here he comes on this day to enforce a rule he himself does not follow. All of this eliciting Jesus' sharp reply, you hypocrites. The synagogue leader fell into the same line of thought that we all too often do too. He may very well have thought that his reason for proclaiming not today was good and holy. He may have just thought he was doing his job. He may have just been trying to make his life easier. After all, if Jesus was going to keep doing things like this on the Sabbath, this, very well, this leader could very well have some upset folks on his hand, sending him some nasty emails and riled up in his office. Whether it is our own personal convenience or just our understanding for how things should go, really whatever it may be, we are often too quick to delay someone's healing, someone's liberation, someone's fullness of life when it doesn't work for us. We may even construct some seemingly good and holy reasons for that delay, but such a delay is simply not within the work Jesus would have us to be about. Such a delay is not built into the promises of healing and justice and mercy and grace that Jesus makes for us and for this world. What Jesus demonstrates for us today, and in so doing what Jesus promises for us today, is that when it comes to healing, when it comes to restoration and being well, when it comes to enacting his promises of life for all, not today is not an option. It seems to me that Jesus would have expected the reaction that he got from the synagogue's leader. It seems to me that he would have known it was coming. I can even imagine him looking over at the leader with a sort of wry, knowing smile, as if to say, watch this. Of course, his intentions and his purpose, his teaching and his healing is much deeper than getting to say, got you. He knows that his work and his promises that we hear today are going to get a reaction. He knows they're going to upset someone, and yet it is as if he is saying back to that leader who says not today, well, then when? If not now, then when? Jesus' answer is that healing and wholeness and liberation and life are a now thing. They cannot wait for tomorrow. They are for day, today. Not today is not an option. The kingdom of God comes to earth, come to earth, meets our plans and rules and control and order and turns it upside down. Jesus is here to proclaim that this woman's healing and liberation is not for another day. Jesus is here to say to you and to me, your healing and restoration and wholeness is not for another day. Jesus' promise is for you for today. And it's this example and this proclamation that sends us forth on this day to go to the powers and principalities, the systems and structures of our own day, and the hurting and lost and all too often cast aside people and say your liberation and healing and wholeness is for now. What we learn today is that this work is disrupted, and it may upset us, but it is necessary. It must happen for God's people to know the abundant life that God has in mind for all. If we are honest with ourselves, we will come to see that we have some reasons, reasons that we have been taught, reasons we've taught ourselves, reasons we've inherited through the practices of our world, whatever they might be. If we are honest with ourselves, we will come to see that we have all kinds of reasons that so often the timing of another person's freedom is simply not convenient for us. It doesn't fit within our timeline. It doesn't match how we think it should have gone. It doesn't go with the way we have done it before, and so we say, maybe another day. But maybe another day is not the gospel promise. It is not the call to action that we have from Jesus today. When it comes to the world suffering and chaos, when it comes to our own worries and fears, when it comes to what keeps us up at night, when it comes to the broken systems and structures of our world that all need healing, 
Jesus says that that work is for today, for now, and that that work is going to take all of us. And if we are really, really honest with ourselves, we will come to see that we construct reasons for us to not believe that God's promises of life and wholeness and goodness are for us too. We too are bent over with the weight of a world whose messiness often feels too heavy to bear. We too are exhausted by a world that continues to enact injustices to those who have only ever been cast aside and forgotten. We too are broken hearted at the rise of ideologies that promote hate and discord. We too know ourselves and all too often believe the lie that shame and scarcity convince us of. In so many ways, we too are hunched over, unable to fully know of the God who has drawn near and who says, you are set free. For as good as we are as making up reasons for liberation and freedom and justice to be postponed for others, and we have shown that we're pretty good at it, as good as we are at that, so too are we compelled by whatever narrative we have weaved in our own hearts and souls that says we are not worthy, nor have we done enough, nor do we have enough right, nor have we figured it all out. To hear the good news of what Jesus has to offer that woman some 2,000 years ago, it still is made on this day and in this place. Earlier on in the sermon, I said that at the intersection of God's work in this world and our own assumptions and plans for how that will be carried out, some big questions start to bubble up for our prayer and reflection. What is holding us back from setting others free? What is our objection to their liberation? And it seems to me that we are being invited to turn that question back on ourselves. What is holding us back from hearing Jesus' words to that woman offered for us too? Why might we not be able to hear and to believe that the promise of abundant life is for us too? Consider those, but also hear this. God's promises of life in its fullness, grace unending, love overflowing, hope without ceasing, they are made on this day for you. There is no doubt that as the ones given the work of building up God's kingdom on earth here and now in this place and in our neighborhood, we have news to tell that God promises life. And we have lives to live that make known this promise too. But so too do we need to hear the good news that that same life is intended for you just as abundantly as it is intended for anyone and everyone else. God is urgently promising rest and release from whatever has weighed us down. That is the good news of this day that we hear for ourselves and that we must share with the world. Thanks be to God.